Is this thing working? No? Well, I'll, I'll yell a little louder then. Yeah, it's working. I'm not mechanical enough to, there we are, got it. Welcome, folks. We got a good group here. Still not on. Well, I'll talk a little louder, and I'll let Connie worry about getting it. Getting it. Now can you hear? All right. I'm not used to these. Let's stand and have the Pledge of the Flag. And I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We've got a good group here, and we're going to have Connie talk about this church and its history. Uh, I wasn't raised in this church. I was in Brand X about three blocks west. Uh, but it means something to me. My wife was the organist here for probably 10 years through high school and college, and then I was married in this church. And uh, that was back in the days when the receptions were coffee and cake in the basement. It wasn't $5,000 in some high-priced place. And uh, the marriages took this as well then as they do now. So a couple announcements. Uh, we have our fundraiser in July at the bank, July 22nd, and we have forms back there which you can register on, and you can certainly do it much later, but if you want to do it today, that's fine. And uh, right there they are, right. And uh, also, the next general meeting will be this fall, and we'll be at uh, Rain's and see uh, Denny's uh, collection again, and we always enjoy that. So, uh, good. Well, I'll call on, on Jean. She's got some comments to make. Where'd she go? You're right here. Right in front of me. I don't really want to use this. Do you know how to get this back up in there? Thank you. I'll try to talk to it. But... Oh, okay. Hi. Okay, so uh, when you a volunteer or work at the Historical Society, you learn about a lot of different people that, you know, were in Kirkland at one time or another. And one of the persons that I uh, found out about and was very interested in was Dion D. Marbell. And if you have your sheet, you can read about him on the back of the sheet, little tidbits. But he um, lived in Kirkland for about 10 to 15 years, and I believe he sat along the Kishwaukee River and wrote this beautiful song that we're going to sing. It was first sung here. He wrote it in 1886 or seven, and it was sung at this very church 137 years ago. So now we have Hannah and Diane that are going to lead us in singing when they ring those golden bells for you and me. So if you're not used to sheet music, this song will go through to the end, and then it says this little Dia Salfine. You're going to go to the third line, and there's a little fancy symbol there, which is the coda, and you'll take that to the where it says fine. So that little line repeats right at the end of each verse. There's a land beyond the river that we call the sweet forever, and we only reach the shore the fire. One by one we'll gain the portals There's to dwell with the immortals When they ring the golden bells for you and me Don't you hear the bells now ringing? Don't you hear the angels singing? Till the glory, hallelujah, jubilee In that far off sweet forever Just beyond the shining river When they ring Shall only know the blessing. 
blessing of our Father's sweet caressing when they ring the golden bells for you and me. Don't you hear the bells now ringing? Don't you hear the angels singing? To the glory, hallelujah, jubilee. In the far off sweet forever, just beyond the shining river, when they ring the golden bells, sweetly slumber when the king commands the spirit to be free nevermore with anguish laden we shall reach that lovely eden when they ring the golden bells for you and me don't you hear the bells now ringing don't you hear the angels singing to the glory hallelujah jubilee in that far off sweet beyond the shining river when they ring the golden bells for you and me. My dad would have been seven years old when he died, but he used to talk about DeMar Bell a lot. Uh, I don't know if you ever saw him or heard him. They used to have a bandstand, I think where the new bank is. And they used to have concerts and that, and he used to talk about that. I think we have some pictures in the historical society of that. Connie said yes. Connie's going to come to speak to us. She knows more about this community than anybody I know. She's smart. Not only that, she's got a motivation to find material, dig it up, put it in our archives. She's a valuable asset to the organization and to this community. She's put in a lot of work with this. Then afterward, we have cookies here, recipes of some of the old folks. Uh, most all of them are long gone, but uh, we can share that. Everybody can take a cookie or two or more. We've got plenty, and uh, we can talk more about this church in the community at that time. Connie? Sometimes it's not good to be built up so much. You have to live up to it. <laughs> okay, I am going to take you down the history path of this Methodist church from 1866 on up to today. Most of it will be chronological, although sometimes I get off on a little tangent and we just kind of shoot up to 2023. The Methodist in this area first met at Charter Oak. I'm echoing, aren't I? I can't talk softer, though. <laughs> well, they met at the Charter Oak um, School, and that was on the corner of Pearl and Cherry Valley Road. And they met there until about 1866 when they built a... This is driving me nuts, Claire. What's, what can I do? Farther away? Okay. Better? Oh, yeah. Okay. Now I can talk. Um, they built a um, church across the road. Which road? We're still not sure. But uh, then it became flourishing. It was a popular area because Cherry Valley Road it goes diagonal, and it was a good route from Chicago to Rockford, so you got a lot of trucks going by and, and horses and carriages and all this kind of stuff. So a great place for a church too. This school is now the Maynard House. And here's a little map of the, um, of the area. Where the, we don't have any pictures of the Charter Oak Methodist Church, but we do know that it had a parsonage built across one of the roads, which one we don't know, and that it um, went through various names. It went from being Charter Oak Methodist Church to the Charter Oak and Kirkland Methodist Church, and finally, Charter Oak Kirkland, because Kirkland was kind of pushing itself away because people knew that Kirkland was growing and wanted its own church here. When the Charter Oak, um, they had the first Sunday school. Does that look like your Sunday school today? Absolutely not. It's all adults. Yes, every adult would go to Sunday school, and then they would come back to 
church or stay for church afterwards. Another first during that time was the Ladies' Aid group. Ladies' Aid um, started out as a, women, a women's society now, but it was a Ladies' Aid that just got involved with everything, and there were splinters that broke off. There was the service guild, which would say, oh my gosh, you need your house cleaned? We'll be there next Saturday, and they spend all day cleaning your house for you, just out of the goodness of their heart. Or the Lady Aid Society would have an all day on a Tuesday, and they would make na aprons, which they sold at bazaars and at the local stores here. Stuff like that. I was a little bit dismayed when I heard or I read that in 1933 they were going to disband the ladies' aid. And then I got like two more minutes in the ledgers later and it said, because we're going to combine four or five groups so that they were just one big ladies' aid group. And eventually they had up to six um, groups here in this church. And in 19... 28 something, they had 98 members. Think, we don't even have that many people sitting in this church right now, but 98 members among the Ladies Aid group that worked in the community and the church and that. I find that phenomenal. Oh, I should go back. Um, one more thing. I gotta stay with my script. In the early 1900s, their biggest money maker for the Ladies Aid was a two day event. Think about organizing this. They had souvenirs, chicken pie supper, several booths at a Rowan house, which is the Red Brick Inn right now. By 1938, it evolved into the Kirkland Homecoming and Feast of Inn Gathering. It was a two-day event, two one-act plays on Friday for 25 cents a ticket. On Saturday were sports and games for all ages. You could get in all kinds of races. Foot races, bicycle races, tricycle, sack races, three-legged races, hog calling contests, women, husband and wife calling contest, tug of war, and my favorite, the fat man race. But you had to be over 200 pounds to get in that one. I don't know how fast they could run. <laughs> Saturday noon was a chicken dinner followed by a ball game of country versus town at 1.30 and booths full of fancy work and canned goods, vegetables, and poultry. I found uh, minutes in 1931 that showed that the six groups existed. This church here, we're gonna, that's it for Charter Oak. This church here was built in 1886. I can't find a picture of it, but you'll see that I kind of cropped it so it's just, it would look just like this without a wing falling off the back. Eliza Arner Ives, commonly known as Granny Ives, decided that we needed this church bad here. So she went on a door-to-door -door fundraising campaign all around Kirkland and surrounding areas to raise $300 by August 13, 1885, in order to buy um, the lots two and three. Lot one here on the corner was given to us by um, Kirk Byers and his wife Mary Byers, and we paid the $300 to Kirk Byers and Byers, or let's see, Kirk Byers and Byers gave us lot one, and then Kirk Byers and Stephen Rowan um, donated lot one. So anyway, we, we owned three lots, and then we were ready to go. That meant that we had to have a cornerstone. So there was a, a Reverend Maxim, Max Ham, from Kirkland, and October 1st, they laid this, I'm presuming it's this cornerstone because it's the only cornerstone I've ever heard them talk about. But look at the dates. They're laying it in 1885. It says 1886 because that's the date they're going to get done with it. And the 1902 was the precursor of the 1903 expansion of this church. So why it doesn't say 1903, I don't know. Maybe they started it in 1902, finished, I don't know. And how would they know that they were going to have that if that's the original cornerstone? So there's a lot of questions about the authenticity of that stone, in my mind anyway. About six months later, after the cornerstone, on March 10th, 1886, they dedicated a debt-free building, which is the actual date on that cornerstone. And E.P. Babcock erected the building 
which was 32 feet wide and 55 feet long. I took a tape measure, I measured it, and it is exact. The vestibule where you came in where I had the table set up is 10 by 10 feet, and I found um, that was exact too. Didn't measure the 70-foot steeple though. <laughs> the church got its first coat, many coats of white paint at that time. Here's a picture of that vestibule. If you look at the, um, I tried to put arrows there. This door here didn't exist until 1903 when they added the back part. We'll talk about in a minute. And there's a beam here, and there's a beam on this side, identical. And I'm thinking those are the outside beams for that vestibule back in 1886 because from that corner of this beam back here is exactly 10 feet. So I thought that was kind of cool. Now, use your imaginations. You just came through that vestibule. The church is brand new. You're walking across rich carpeting. You're going to be on one of 170 opera chairs that goes from about where Valerie's sitting all the way up here. They're facing the south side. Over here, you have a large chancel chair and two small chancel chairs. You're listening to Reverend Adrian speak. Each one of your opera um, chairs holds a book, an envelope, and a hat rack. Behind you, oh, overhead, you've got two very fine chandeliers. One's holding 12 lamps and the other one, five lamps. Behind you, over here, there's a balcony which holds your choir. And underneath is a Sunday school with common chairs. No opera chairs for those kids. <laughs> the windows, right here where I'm standing, like those two windows there, are colored glass. And behind you, that wall, colored glass windows. In 1886, March 10th, the dedication of the church building with many clergymen participating, Treasurer Griggs got up and said that, you know, we need $1,600 more to cover the building of this church. And they had three dedication services that day, and the first one they got $850. Remember, this is back in 1886 when it, money was, you know, much more scarce. And then in the evening service, they had $600 more subscribed. So they actually took in $50 more than what they needed. This brownie group, or known as the ABC Club, was part of um, Ada Proctor's Sunday School. And they um, fundraised and bought most of the stained glass windows that were in this church. Actually, um, that Proctor lady, she went off to Africa to marry a missionary. So she dumped her sister with leading the group. And she wasn't too happy about that until she found out that she could fill her, her shoes. By 1900, we had a junior Epworth League and an Epworth League. What in the hell is that? <laughs> it's the precursor to the MYF that most of you would know, and for us Lutherans, the youth group. Um, in around the 1930s, they put out this um, newspaper which advertised 25 Kirkland businesses, um, and they did a whole bunch of different uh, mission trips and different things um, that normal groups do. Skipping to 1900, there was a guy named Brother Breen. I don't know anything else about him, but he built this parsonage for $1,000. It uh, sat where the current parking lot and the memorial garden are. The Methodist Conference book said his accomplishment was, quote, something hardly to have been expected, but done so easily that one wonders why it had not occurred before. 30 years after it was built, there was a Reverend McKilley who was living there, and he was thinking about moving on, and they didn't want to lose him. So they promised to um, put in running water and build him a bathroom if he would stay a few more years. He said, I don't know. Well, anyway, he went on a conference, and by the time he got back, George Ault had donated all the bathroom fixtures, and they had started on the bathroom and the running water. Prior to that, they used the outdoor um, privy, and they had a cistern at the kitchen sink and uh, a well outside for water, which some of you who are my age and older can remember in some of our grandparents' houses. Um, needless to say, he stayed for a while. 
There was a fire, in our, a lightning hit that parsonage in 1941, and it charred the whole attic and didn't destroy anything else because it started raining really hard and we had a quick fire department um, response. But the problem was that they lost all of their membership records, and they had to have a huge committee and pastors for the next few years that tried to re, um, restore them and recreate them. And we've recently put all of the archival stuff in a filing cabinet in the back room. And, and they're right. There's nothing, you know, prior to the 40s, there's, there's nothing for this church. But there's ladies' aid stuff going back to 1900 because I think the ladies kept it in their houses because they didn't want to trust it to the church probably. I don't know why, but the ladies' aid stuff is pretty complete. The parsonage was rented out until 1992, and then it was demolished. And James F. Montgomery operated Don Taylor's excavating uh, machinery, while Bernie Robertson hauled the debris to the Brennan Cattle Company. In 1992 or 1993, Shirley Yates, Jean's mom, um, decided we need a memorial garden. So she started the big memorial garden that you see on the other side of this church. And here, Helen McKee is helping her water. Today, Marianne Collins does the garden and keeps it looking well and mulches and all that kind of stuff. I do the front of the church and around the parsonage. 1903, we need major renovations. The parishioners tore down the balcony over here on the north end of the church. They raised the entire building and added new wings to the east behind you where the cookies are and behind me on the west. The east wing behind you was a classroom and the west wing was made into a chancel and they put the pulpit in the the pulpit was here and the choir was behind us and there was a rectangular stained glass window on the, um, where the cross is. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, there's the thing. Weston Bram took this picture for me and I lightened as much as I can. It looks pretty black, but um, it's really deep, dark purple and it could be very, very dirty, but this windstorm took the plexiglass off of it, and it broke a couple pieces of the, of the stained glass out, and the letting is really, really bad, and it says Ladies Aid Society on that, and they're debating what to do with it, if they should just cover it over with plexiglass, try to restore it, or whatever. If you know anyone that's good with letting and stained glass, um, talk to Peter Bram or a pastor or somebody here, and uh, they would love your input on it. That's her. <laughs> um, 1903, that original stained glass to your right was put in. Granny Ives' husband had uh, died in 1901, so she put it on in his memory, and you can see that right above that middle cross that I've got leaning against the window. Uh, Granny Ives would be Judy Printerville, um, Greg McKee, and Donna Turner's great-grandmother. Unfortunately, in 1944, right after Easter, April 10th, there was a huge windstorm, and it caused two sections of that window to blow out, except for a few valuable pieces in those two sections that didn't break. The window had to be built anew, costing several hundred dollars, a large share covered by insurance. In the meantime, the whole window was covered by flexiglass, uh, fabric flexiglass, same as uh, was on the one that just blew out over here, so that's why we're a little worried about does that one need to be replaced or is it still sturdy? Um, but anyway, the work was completed on May 26th, about a month and a half after it broke. And just look at the colors, either in person or what. On the right side, there's that light kind of green, and on the left side wing, there's the, the golds that are in it. Which one's old and which one's new? One of those had to be one of the two pieces that blew out. And then I sat here one day, and I was trying to look at all the, the little windows that are here and say, hmm, if they're like the one in there, then that has to be the original. Anyway, I can't figure it out. I'll leave you have that conundrum. Inside that window, she incorporated three main um, symbols. The center stump of Jesse, Jesus was a descendant of Jesse coming from that stump. The sheaves of wheat symbolize immortality and resurrection, and for some, time, some theolo the, 
theologians, the body of Christ. And the dove over the Bible is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, which with the word would lead us to Christ and the heavenly afterlife. 1906, this is three years after what I just talked about, came a remodeling. They must have had it in mind um, when they were doing the 1903 things, I'm thinking. The basement was excavated for our dining room and our kitchen. And below me, if I get back here, um, was a coal room. And that coal room was used for 46 years. In September of 1952, men from this church spent nights and weekends and long, tiring hours trying to clean it out and clean it up. They took, um, let me go back, that sample of uh, stone you see on the left side of the slide is part of this wall that was taken out. Uh, um, a while back, we had uh, the bathroom pipes were freezing down in the women's bathroom, and the guys were working on it. And I kept coming by there to see, and one day, I saw this, and I thought, oh, wow, that's the original stone. And this guy says, don't you dare take a picture. You've got to delete that off your phone right now. So you're not really seeing this, okay? Because I said, why? And he says, well, you can't get it online, or, or I could get in a big trouble, you know, with all these, you know. I don't know. So anyway, he went on. I didn't understand it. But anyway, I deleted two or three of them in front of him, and I came back later, and I took this one. So <laughs> he doesn't know that I have it, you know. But, but I think it's a good cause. You wouldn't have never seen it if I didn't take that picture. Um, the back entrance, um, which is beside the coal room, um, was redone in 1954 by Wayne Way and James Byers. They took on this project um, at the same time, Ray Way saw to it that there was a new furnace using hot water heat was put in, and before that, they had two furnaces using um, forced air. All right, now I'm back to the 1906, okay? And in the back, uh, below that, they added a kitchen when they excavated it all out. There was a stairway in the very back corner that went downstairs leading to the kitchen. And you can probably see the door that that led to is right here, okay? Um, sometime between 2001 and 2009, the stairway from the back of the sanctuary down to that door was uh, torn out to be able to get four more feet in the kitchen. And that's when they did all the, the remodeling. The 2009... Some things I should also point out is that, okay, we'll go here. Uh, see the white cabinets and the, the old chairs? This is kind of like what I've been told that the birthday chairs look like, but no one can totally confirm it. This is the kitchen from one side. Those white cabinets we'll see again. And then this is the 2009 renovation. And the renovation from the other side, it cost $91,663.95. And it was spearheaded um, by co-chairmans Donna Turner and Martha Brooks. Um, it took cramped walking space and these old white cabinets and changed them into what you see here, double oven, a convenient island, and new, all the new cabinets and that. Then there was a 2000, I'm skipping ahead a little bit, I'll come back to 2000, or 1906. Um, they had a, we had the flood in 2017 where we had four days of flooding in our basement. We had over six inches in that basement, causing about $134,000 in damage. About 90,000 of that was covered by insurance. It ruined the carpet, it, uh, the tiling, the baseboards, even the wooden paneling. You can see the, uh, not in that one, yeah. I don't know, it's hard to see, but uh, there's like the t peeling of the things there. Water came in through the windows, up through the things. We had about 12 uh, shop vacs that we borrowed and bought, and it took 24-hour manning of those to empty them in order to get the water to keep up with it and that. There's a panoramic view. Nope. Not yet. Um, this is the east wall, stripped, rebuilt, 
The white in front of it is the tiling that hadn't been pulled up yet. Eventually, all the tiling and the carpet went out, and it ended up being um, cement. And they were like, wow, this kind of looks kind of good. And then they hired somebody to come in and polish it, and it gives it a beautiful sheen. If you want to walk down uh, later and look, you can. Uh, Weston Bram sent me this picture this week, says, who's that person in there? I said, oh, it's me. <laughs> but I thought, you know, maybe God wanted you to see this. So I put it in here, and you can just see how devastating the water was and how much water there was in the parking lot. Um, I put this one in because you can see the, the, my mom would call it a digger, the excavation machine there. Um, the engineers left us little hope of fixing the situation other than digging around uh, with a backhoe completely around the church and uh, adding clay to the water, draining the water out of the foundation whenever it rained a lot. And Weaver of Sycamore did the outside work. He laid this pipe um, around the building making five huge drain, um, drainage things. Um, the 2017 disaster was covered by insurance, the Gibson Paulson Foundation, and returns on our apportionments from, to the Methodist Church. Here's the basement. I took this this Christmas. You can see the decorations there. Um, changes made in the basement included adding energy efficient LED lighting, mold resistant walls and floors, Carpet and tile removal revealed the concrete that we talked about. The building was brought up to code with emergency and exit lights added and outdoor. Besides the, the clay and the five large catch basins, um, it, it just was completely redone. The only other flood I found in history was in the 1980s uh, during a Reverend Price's tenure. And it was at that time that these two furnaces um, we got these two furnaces to replace the ones that had been flooded. And John Begun, um, he installed these. Uh, there might have been other floods, but at least that's all I found in the record books. Okay, 1903 and 1906 expanded us east, west, and down. Now we're going to skip to the 1930s, and we're going to expand south beyond that wall. Claire's Church was built in 1903, and they closed down in 1926. They donated their church to us. We could use the wood any way we wanted. In March of 31, it was torn down and moved to Kirkland. Eleanor Tyndall told me her husband, Marshall, was one of those that donated a hay rack that brought the wood from Claire to Kirkland. Volunteers, many out of work from the depressions, both Methodist and Lutheran, were stressed in the notes dug the basement at the south end of Kirkland and um, used the donated materials to build that whole wing. Lester Minion was the pastor there, and he said he was having a hard time, and he wrote this in his June 21st, 1931 message. Quote, The most difficult part of building our addition is completed. Most of us thought that we would have to hire a mason to lay the foundation stone. No one would attempt it but Mr. Henry Aves, and thanks to Mr. Aves, the foundation is laid, unquote. Henry Aves is Sue Aves Sester's grandfather. Minion continued, the next step is floor joists, and we expect to report next Sunday that they're already laid. Men who are not busy can report any day to the church, and we can provide recreational labor. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful humor? We are anxious to have every man in the church and have some part in the work of building our new Sunday school building. And you know what? He wasn't kidding. Um, I found um, his, he, he made a list of all the people that worked on the, on the building. And I'm going to just give you a few of the names that I, that I recognize, so I thought that some of you would recognize too. They were Henry A's, that you see here, uh, George Buxton, Elmer Law, Clyde Smith, Lloyd Klein, A.W. Lamont, which is, is that Becky, is that your grandpa? Art. Art. Um, Lloyd Klein, um, A.E. Menz, who had the grocery or meat market, George Tyndall, George Vaniel, Vandling, Earl Wenzel, Robert Warden. And that's only about a third of them. Um, but the boys also got involved. They had to prepare the lays and the wood, and they carried them back and forth. And it just kills me because... Boys, Glenn Aves, 
Sue's dad. I, I always thought of him as old. I never thought of him as a boy running things around. Um, Corwin Lamont, Elmer Littlejohn, Donald Thurlby, and there were several others. And they called these guys the Knights of Construction. Isn't that cool? And they had um, three dedication services. And on the second of the three dedication services, they came in and down the two aisles and filled the front pew so that they were honored. And they were also honored at a potluck on Friday night. So that was, that was pretty cool. So let's go to the basement. What did they build? This is the uh, basement level Sunday school. And that's the west side. And here's the, maybe I can make it work. There's the east side. Um, Sunday school, nursery. It also uh, serves as an overflow for funeral dinners or other kind of dinners. And we make the eggs there for the July 4th uh, um, breakfast. breakfast. Thank you. Uh, back in the days of the turkey supper, that's where they carved the turkeys too. There's the furnace room. And the other side of the furnace room, that was part of that. The main floor um, was Sunday school rooms until 1972. The women's side decorated and carpeted the church school rooms to the south of the sanctuary. One Sunday school room is now the pastor's study here. She loves to redecorate and get her husband to help her move things and rebuild them and all that kind of stuff. It's just gorgeous. And if you go through that door in the back wall, you come up to uh, the treasurer's office, which is Lori Finkel's office, and the knitting ministry now has their uh, yarn kept on the other side of it. This small Sunday school room is now the secretary's office, Jamie's. And the largest Sunday school room is uh, now a meeting room. And on the wall of that meeting room is a bell. It buzzes. Well, it used to buzz. And it would tell people, not only in the church, but also in the parsonage, when this bell rings, Sunday school's over. Come and get your kids. We want them out of here. <laughs> Remember, I didn't go to this church, so I, I only get this through my husband and other people. So I, I don't know. Maybe they wanted to stay longer. Um, anyway, this south wing, minus the stairs there, um, was dedicated in 1933. The outside exit was added in 1958 for safety reasons. And when it was all done, October 18, 1934, the church had a farewell party for Reverend Laughlin. They celebrated that they completed all the payments on the building during his tenure, which included a five room church school building, redecorating, rewiring, and relighting the church itself three years for that wing to be done. In um, men's, Methodist Men's Club, I found records or mention of them all the way back to 1900s, but um, they created this Kirkland Servicemen's Gazette from 42 to 46, and they sent this four to six page paper out once a month to servicemen in, um, overseas. And I thought it was interesting because it had Methodist and Lutheran information in it. And when Reverend Olson from here left, Reverend Nelson from the Lutheran Church took it over. And then he handed it back to Reverend Ames when he came back here. So it was just kind of a whole community type thing to make sure it get, got done. It started out with 35 papers. The very first one grew to 85 by the end of the first year. And beside the 85 they were mailing out, they gave out 300 at the post office, the bank, and all those places that you would leave them in town. Some of these copies of this paper are preserved in the Kirkland Historical Society, and you can um, see them there. The Men's Society is much smaller now. It's a small group of guys that meet the third Saturday at 7 a.m. at the KFR, and if any of you want to join them, um, they buy their own breakfast and have fellowship and just gossip. <laughs> Sorry, Larry, I didn't say that. But the Men's Club, um, back in the day were most noted for their turkey suppers. They, not the women, started them and worked them. Um, they started them in 1934 with five turkeys from the Earl Wenzel turkey farm and five from the Banks and Alt turkey farm. 
Tickets cost 60 cents a piece. By 1941, they were serving 24 large turkeys. The turkeys were cut, uh, made at home and brought in, and the men carved them in the back room. Today, because of health laws, everything has to be made here. Um, so they couldn't do that. Some people like Dora Gleason and Grace McKee, they roasted two turkeys apiece, and everyone thought that was phenomenal. When the suppers grew more than the men could handle, they invited the women in, and of course, women get involved, they expand, and so then they started the bazaars up here. By 1963, you needed an advanced reservation. Uh, Wilbur and um, Martha Lamont, they took reservations for 20 years before they handed it off in 1984 to Mr. and Mrs. Paul Wickler. The last turkey supper was 1999. Rather than um, th that, let's see, they sold tickets for $6.50. $5.90 more than the very first one. They served 470 people in four seatings in the dining room, 178 carryouts. Profits were $4,396 from the dinners and donations. The bake sale and craft items made over $2,000. They cooked 32 turkeys, baked 118 pies, 63 dozen rolls, mashed 250 potatoes, during the flood, I was helping clean out the kitchen, and I found a masher that had to be at least three and a half feet tall. Now I understand why they needed one that big. <laughs> they opened four cases of corn and 12 large cans of cranberries for this finale. You can see a grocery list for one of them, and I don't know what year it is out there on the table when you go out. In 1947, they had a piano, and it finally wore out this year. Nobody knew that our organist, Hannah, who was singing here for you, was playing with stuck keys and some keys that didn't work, and she still made it sound beautiful. So um, we replaced it, um, thanks to Ellen Aves' family, uh, in a memorial to him, um, this organ was bought. There was a Reverend Cox here from 58 to 62, and um, there's a list up there of the things that he accomplished. The one thing that up there that, what's a docile curtain? Lori Finkel and um, Jean Esther at a funeral says, well, geez, that was the curtain that hung in the back of the sanctuary. I looked and looked and looked till I found this, and then I brightened it up like 90%. But you can see that they had big, blue curtains that hung on either side of the cross from curtain rods. Um, and that's where that Ladies' Aid Society window that you could see from the outside but not the front uh, used to hang. 1965, Esther and Ira Aves gave a new signboard outside. I can't change the writing on it now without thinking of those two. And now my favorite story, 1966, we made it to. Everett Poff went up to Shorty Esther one Sunday, says, next Saturday, here, wear your old clothes and bring a flashlight. What are we going to do? I'm not telling you, just come in your old clothes and bring a flashlight. And he got here to the church, and there was this huge ladder going up to this um, trap door which you walked under and probably didn't notice. They went in there, they climbed up the steeple across, and is, if you're, depending on where you're sitting, there's a flat spot in the top part of this church on the ceiling. They walked across that, they got over here to the end, and they found like a, Shorty told, told me it was like a trap door that they pried loose, and they opened it up, because um, Everett take, took a hammer, and they found this stained glass light um, illuminating a 16 by 30 foot unfinished area. They had found their new upper room youth room. They had went to the council and everything, and they tried to find some way that they could find a place for the youth to meet. They thought about expanding the church. They thought about renting halls downtown, and voila. They found it here. There was memorial money left to, um, oh wait a minute. First of all, the church decided that they would do the inside stairs there that you see on the left. And they, they paid for that. 
then the youth had memorial money left to them, plus they did all kinds of fundraisers so that they could buy the paneling, the flooring, and they did much of the work themselves and, and had to have some parents come in and, and help them with some things. Um, they named it the Ruffham Road. Read upwards, Methodist Youth Fellowship Upper Room. That, and they were so proud of that. If you don't think they're proud of it, just talk to Lori Finkel. She gets this huge smile on her face. And for me, I didn't live through it, so it's not exciting to me. But don't say that to them. <laughs> the sponsorship went from Shorty and Bev Esther to Elaine and uh, Robert Tutt in 1973, and then to Reverend Barbara Page Kell in 83. The current furniture that's in there um, was donated by Ty and Donna Turner in 2010. They, that room has seen a lot of things. Um, back when I was working with the youth, we had a, a whole bunch of post-football parties up there, and we'd play games and have refreshments and stuff. In the back left corner of the slide, there's an attic um, looking both ways, and we keep all of our Christmas ornaments um, and decorations up there and uh, past treasure stuff and it doesn't look organized, but it is. And if they ever wanted to expand, they could probably find the same kind of storage on the other side, which was never done. Two years later, we purchased the Shanelmeyer House from Owen and L Lena Lucas. With pledges and the church property mortgage, it became the new parsonage. And that same day, Reverend Park and his family um, moved in. In 68, the docile curtain was gone and um, Wayne Way and Roger Wolf, a classmate of mine, built the wooden frame um, that was previously given by Claire Barchard, a relative of Jean Clox. They wired and hung it so that it would illuminate. Um, it's kind of cool. I couldn't find where we made it illuminate, so that's why the picture wasn't illuminated. That same year, the Ladies Aid uh, bought the Ameri early American furniture that you see up here now. Um, and Mavis Bell came up with a whole bunch of paint, and they repainted the place, too. 1970, the church had been painted inside and out, and the sidewalk and curbing was being put in. I never noticed that. It was the year I graduated, and I never noticed that being done. 1971, Fairdale <coughs> um, was assigned to be a two-point charge with us since they shared a common school district. And under Reverend Park, the Fairdale Church merged with uh, the Kirkland Church, and they, were voted, they voted to be named the First United Methodist Church of Kirkland. 1976, we got the new entryway. I left... Um, the old one here, because by now you can't remember the beginning of my presentation. Look at that moss, or whatever it is. And then the new one. Uh-oh, what happened? Oh, okay. Um, it, so that, the entryway was 1976, the same year they decided to add a second bathroom. I'm guessing that that was the men's bathroom. Um, and it now looks like this, men's and women's. The church urns, and that came in 1977, and we uh, had aluminum siding on there. I can't tell you how many references I had. Well, we painted the church white again, and now no more paint. We just have to spray Weston's um, grass clippings off the front. If you go the other way around, you won't do that. In 1886, um, one of our big birthdays, Ty Turner uh, made the replica of this church, um, of our church from back in 1886. Uh, Jenny Haddock designed it. And this is the float that she designed, one of the 12 floats that she designed for this church, uh, church and helped build. And that's the one that has the church in it. The little church is now, I believe, in the garage and comes out once in a while for certain things. Many facets of this church can't be covered in this short a time. Um, so we'd like to invite you back for all kinds of things. We have knitting ministry here on the second and fourth Tuesdays of the month and um, donate those things to three counties um, 
around Christmas time. Guys can come to the men's breakfast on the third Saturday of the month. July 1st, you can have a full breakfast down in the basement. We're going to do it again this year on that Saturday. Um, throughout the 4th of July celebration, you can go out to the refreshment tent in the front of the church for conversation. Last year, we had a whole bunch of teenagers that sat down and talked to um, the people manning it. Uh, it was really pretty interesting and fun. The Women's Society is running their annual rummage sale this September 14th through 16th with the drop-off, the 11th through the 13th. It's going to be $10 a bag again this year. By the way, the rummage sales go back as far as at least 1920 in this church. Found that out, too. Um, you can look for the sec second annual Trunk or Treat this October. And then don't forget our cookie extravaganza during Kirkland and Christmas. Um, you can find any kind of sweet treat we treat that um, you want practically back here. I have one more tradition to um, share with you. Back in the day, when, pe when kids had birthdays, they had a white birthday chair. I don't think I have it. Yeah. Anyway, Sissy had a birthday April 12th, and I had one April 13th, and we thought that you guys should actually experience being a Methodist back in the day. Let's see if that's yours. And first of all, you sing to us. And then I'll explain the church. Okay. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear sissy. Happy birthday to you. Yep. And then, because they would count as all the kids would put their, the kid that had the birthday would put their penny inside. I can't get mine open. Um, they would put their pennies in, but you know what? We're just too old for that. So we've got dimes. And the congregation helps them count. So we're going to count for sissy first. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 1, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66. Congratulations. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 1. Not being a Methodist, I'd never experienced it before, and I thought it'd be kind of fun, too. <laughs> Thank you, Sissy. Daddy, where did the money go? I have no clue. <laughs> it probably, it was, a, it was a Sunday school thing, so we'll have to ask Peter Bram. Okay. And, and hopefully he's a lot smarter than I am, because I couldn't figure out how to open it. Because there was already a coin in there, so, yeah. So anyway, that was their tradition. And I'm going to end on this slide. I found a cookbook at the Historical Society from the ladies from the 1930s or 40s. And I chose 10 recipes out of there. And I kind of tried them out on all my friends and the places that I went and stuff. And I ended up making, um, well, I had to thank Trudy Loomis from the Lutheran Church. She's in my ladies' A group. She made two of the cookies, and I made the other eight. And the people that you see there, Esther Ayes, she's a grandmother and aunt, or cousin through marriage to Sue Sester and Sissy Butts, and a grandmother to Barry and Kevin Aves. Um, Evelyn Butler, Sissy's aunt. Ella Meyer is my husband's aunt. Mamie uh, Woodard is Dana Woodard's grandmother from, he was, she was from Fairdale. Florence Wenzel, they, she and her husband ran the Wenzel um, turkey farm. Um, Jane Gibson would be David Paulson's mom and a distant relative to me and a distant relative to my husband, which makes us incestual through <laughs> several, several generations. But anyway, Mamie Tyndall, Becky Lamont's grandma, and Grace McTee McKee, uh, who is Donna Turner's grandma. And then um, there were two that I don't have on there, and that's Leela Turner. I could not find a picture of her. She ran a grocery store with her husband downtown and Claire Hewitt, the pastor's wife. So I just want to tell you that it was fun trying these recipes out because these ladies would say in their recipe, add enough flour to make it sticky. 
add eggs. I mean, you can guess on vanilla, but some of them use a low oven. And, you know, you just kind of guess on that, and we played with it until we got them. So I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much. Oh, there's books back there, too, that have the recipes in them. Thank you.